So thank you for coming today. I'm Clementina. And today we're going to talk about how to feel sexy and initiate ocean conversations by wearing a ghost fishing nets. Uh, so I just wanted to check quickly who's in the audience uh, in terms of like why you came here. So I'm just going to pose a few questions and raise your hand if that's why you came here. So who came here uh, because you want to feel sexy? <laughs> <laughs> okay, some honest people in the audience. <laughs> uh, who here came because you wanted to hear about ocean solutions? Okay, great. <laughs> and who here came because the title didn't make sense and you were just simply curious? <laughs> okay, <laughs> great. <laughs> we have from everybody. Any other reasons why you're here? Okay, great. I think we covered it all. Um, Okay, so what I want to share with you today, um, I think it would be the best to share it through my own personal journey and story. So I will start sharing a little bit about myself and like that through the story you will find out how I came to this uh, product, but also hopefully it will resonate with some of you and even help you on your own journey. Uh, and at the end of the event, we'll also have some fun and maybe try uh, some of the dresses if you want. Uh, <laughs> uh, okay, so I grew up in uh, Macedonia. Does anybody not know where that is? So uh, that's in the Southeast Europe, in the Balkan Peninsula. Uh, and basically Macedonia is a little bit of a small country, so we're just two million inhabitants, a bit of a cut-off country, I would say, from the world because we're not in the EU. Uh, it's difficult to travel due to visa issues or sometimes fi finance issues because the standards are a little, bit, a little bit lower. And so I think that my views on world issues started broadening up when I started volunteering in one of the biggest uh, student organizations in the world for leadership development and exchange called ISAC. And so in ISAC, I started working and uh, led various teams national and international on these like world issues in Macedonia and Austria. Uh, so that's where I started getting like a little bit more uh, attached to these like problems and, and understanding them and putting myself out there as well um, to work on them. Uh, and so as I uh, rounded up my kind of like volunteering experience and work experience uh, in ISEC, I became an ISEC alumni and so I wanted to s more explore further the world. So the first country was Austria, but then what's next? Um, I found uh, an interesting opportunity in Belgium and uh, I joined one of the biggest corporations in the world, uh, Deutsche Post DHL, uh, which was uh, a very interesting experience of seven years uh, where I worked on, uh, basically, what I learned mostly there is like how global supply chains work. So from smaller companies, but also by working with the biggest companies in the world in technology, life sciences, and aviation. So understanding the supply chains was really, really important for me to understand how actually everything works. Um, beyond that, I developed uh, and built uh, multi-million dollar programs, worked on developing new business opportunities, but what really excited me was when I worked on, um, supply, on basically making supply chains more efficient so that there is no waste, uh, so that we can have products who last much longer and, so, and we can also repurpose products. So that was really where my passion line and that was really when I, was, I started getting really, really excited. Uh, I even went on and designed uh, Deutsche Post DHL Global Circular Economy Strategy, so group-wide. Uh, however, as that was not uh, so such a big part of my job, I found myself spending a lot of the time working with uh, environmental stand up startups and NGOs in my own time. Uh, I was even doing a lot of climate change presentations, and so the, the lifestyle became a little bit too much and unsustainable, and at some point I decided that I will spend 100% of my time uh, working on environmental solutions. So that's when I made a pretty big, big step. Uh, I basically moved to, uh, rounded up my experience in DHL and decided to move to Asia to work with the charity where I currently work. So that's the Reef World Foundation. Um, the Reef World Foundation um, is basically working in partnership with the UN Environment uh, and we're um, making sustainable diving and snorkeling the social norm globally. 
so that's done through a program called Greenfins, uh, and it's basically done in a way that it reduces uh, local impacts from coastal areas like this to coral reefs to make them more resilient to fight bigger threats such as climate change. Uh, and so I went, I started uh, my journey in the Philippines. And even though I was pretty clear about what I'm going to do with my job, even though it was a new, uh, new role for the charity, uh, they actually first wanted me to get my diving skills uh, on a higher level and wanted me to get certified as a rescue diver. So that's when the interesting part start, started for me. So this is one of the photos when I uh, actually uh, completed my last exercise and, or, as a rescue diver. Uh, and I basically spent a lot of time uh, in the water, those uh, one week and afterwards as well. Um, it was a very interesting journey because I was always connected to environmental problems. I knew I wanted to work on environmental problems, but I had never, even though I loved the beach, I had never been so connected to the ocean or living ne right next to the ocean. Uh, and also just simply exploring the underwater world. So this is one of the photos that a friend of mine took during one of the dives. And even for my 30th birthday, uh, that was last year, I did a night dive. And a day before I said, there's no way I'm going to do that. Uh, and I actually rarely say stuff like this, so I was really scared to do that. But anyways, I did that, and it was just like one other challenge uh, overcome, uh, and just also a better connection with uh, the ocean. So I saw a lot of beauty, like you see in the picture. Uh, and let me just give you a roundup of uh, why the ocean is so important for us as a species, for example. Um, I don't know if you knew some of the statistics, but uh, the ocean uh, or water covers 71% of Earth's surface. So that's pretty big. Um, also, what, ex what I wasn't aware of before as well is that 94% of all life is aquatic, which means that those of us who live on land are actually a minority here. <laughs> Um, and another uh, interesting data is that uh, around 70% or even more of the oxygen we breathe comes from the ocean itself. Um, so it's a really, really important ecosystem for us. But throughout that journey, even though I, l I saw a lot of beauty and um, I learned so much more about the ocean, I also saw a lot of unsustainable practices that were happening. Also because uh, we were already trying to, so, so I, w I was already aware and trying to also find some of these issues because I was working in the industry as well and trying to make it better. But I also saw just too many things and I decided that I want to do something. Let me just give you a bit of a roundup of what are the biggest threats to the ocean so that you're maybe like a little bit clearer. So we're talking here about like overfishing, land and coastal pollution, habitat destruction, and warming and acidification that are um, initiated by climate change and increasing greenhouse gases and CO2 emissions. Um, so basically, because I was, so I was living in the Philippines, and but afterwards I started to spend much more time in Bali. And obviously we all see here the pollution problems. Uh, even this fish that you see on, on the photo uh, has been entangled in a ghost fishing net. Um, and so seeing the pollution around me, uh, it was super visible and I decided to focus on this pillar, which is coastal and land pollution. I yet didn't know what that's going to be. Uh, then I went to Nusa Penida and I started picking up some ghost fishing gear from one of the most beautiful beaches that I've ever, ever seen, uh, Atu Beach. Um, and I just started getting connected to the, to the problem, even though I wasn't sure what my next steps will be. Just to give you an idea about like ghost fishing gear and nets, so around 640,000 tons uh, end up in the ocean per year. Every year, a new number, new amount of those. Uh, and that's suffocating marine life, entangling marine life, suffocating corals, so it's really, really a big problem for for marine uh, environment and basically us, like we saw. Um, and so I wanted to do something and I had a lot of ideas and I still do and I still have them written, uh, but nothing was clicking right away. So basically, um, 
as I was doing my trip to Nusa uh, Penida, I asked myself a question. I asked myself, what if my approach to this is wrong? Because I, I want to do so many things, I'm looking, I'm, I want to do so many solutions, but nothing was really clicking, nothing was really true for me. And so I was thinking, I went there thinking I want to fix the ocean or the ocean problem, but actually what I realized is that maybe first I needed to fix myself or start with myself. And now how to start with myself? So I returned to Bali. Uh, actually, Nusa Benita is kind of Bali, uh, but I returned to the island. Um, and that was just days before going back to my country, Macedonia, for my best friend's wedding. And so what happened is that I was uh, back here and um, I was looking for a dress. Uh, and I went to Changu, Seminyak, Ubud. I really didn't like anything. I am super, super picky with my apparel. Uh, and uh, this was a special wedding for me as well. So I really wanted to look super nice, sexy, uh, elegant. Uh, so I wanted just to be special. But I also didn't want anything that I'm just going to wear for one occasion. I'm like that. I'm very functional. Um, and so then I figured, what if I actually design and create my own dress out of uh, upcycled materials. And so the first two ideas that came to my mind was, one, can I design an upcycled dress myself? And what would it be made of? Can it be made of plastics or ghost fishing nets? And then the second question that popped to my mind, this is really interesting. I'm not a typical person who goes to weddings, I guess. So uh, I was thinking maybe this can also educate some people in the wedding. Maybe. I can just impact at least or educate at least one person or just like, you know, initiate the conversations with one person. Uh, so I wanted to initiate conversations at the wedding. <laughs> uh, and then I was thinking, and what if it's a multifunctional and I can wear it multi-purpose and I can wear it also when I have other occasions or even not for only a wedding, but other occasions as well. So. Um, then I was thinking, and what if it actually requires minimal maintenance? Because I really don't like to maintain things. I don't want to iron because I travel all the time and it's difficult. So I want something very simple and easy. And so I got, um, yeah, the, the most important thing, obviously, like I mentioned as well, I was thinking I really want to be expressive, elegant, sexy, but I also really want love minimalism. So I w want something very simple. And so just days before the wedding, I got obsessed with finding a way to make it happen. Um, and uh, yes, I put in a lot of research, work. Uh, I was even moving countries, so that was quite difficult to organize everything. Uh, but at the end, uh, there is a bad news and a good news. I'm going to start with the bad news. So the bad news is that um, the fabric that I found didn't arrive on time. So basically, one day before the wedding, uh, me and my mom uh, bought a fabric and made a super cool dress still. So we've been doing this since I was young. Uh, I was always designing and my mom was sewing. Uh, and so that was not strange for us. Um, yeah, so something turned out well, but uh, the fabric was not there. It wasn't a recycled uh, dress. Um, and uh, that was a pity, but um, then there is a good news as well. So the good news is that now uh, I have actually a collection of minimalist and sensual apparel, uh, all made uh, using recycled fabrics, who uh, are basically made from ghost fishing nets, uh, carpets, and other recycled materials. Um, I know you're probably curious about the process and like a little bit about how it works behind that, about the recycling. So I just wanted to share a quick video with you. Guys, uh, sound for the video? Sorry. <laughs> Let me know when you're ready. Ah, oh, okay. Why should making beautiful things harm our planet? 
Nature turns old into new? Why can't we? What if we could make old waste into stylish new products to use and then regenerate in a true sustainable cycle? We've made it happen. We give new life to old carpets, plastic components, and fishing nets recovered around the world by transforming them into Echineal, a pure nylon yarn of uncompromising quality. It makes products that are beautiful outside and in because they don't cost the earth. Echineal is in fact 100% regenerated and 100% regenerable infinitely. A movement is growing. Many partners have joined us to create superb products with the Echineal story inside. From eco-friendly clothing by smart designers to future-ready interiors by visionary architects, but we could do so much more. Just imagine, what if enlightened designers made products to recycle for zero waste? What if consumers followed their heart, proud to make a difference? There is a way, be part of it. That's a little bit about the process, uh, about how the ghost fishing nets um, are recycled. So basically, uh, a bunch of uh, companies and partners are involved to get them out of the ocean, uh, and a lot of volunteer divers. And then the whole process is uh, recreated in the background to come up to uh, this recycled yarn, which can be reused actually in very different fabrics. Um, and so the fabrics on the market vary, and uh, I've been lucky to find one that actually fits uh, what I wanted to, to do. And so essentially, the product is upcycled. It actually cleans the oceans. Um, it promotes solutions. So the design is uh, promoting actually minimalism because it's also a, a very minimalist design. Uh, which is, as a lifestyle as well, an interesting choice sometimes, just reminding us that we can actually use maybe less, but more quality and better. Uh, also, circular value chains. So we have something that was considered waste and actually polluting the ocean, now having such a value and being designed into something so beautiful. Um, zero waste as well. So all the leftovers from the dress, um, when it's uh, being uh, created, produced, are kept uh, to actually empower local entrepreneurs and be recreated in kind of like chairs. That's the idea for now. Um, and also it educates. Uh, so each color, uh, well, we have the four colors here. Each color promotes different parts of the marine ecosystem. And uh, we will play a little game later uh, for that. To, to pick which color presents what uh, ecosystem. It's at, uh, essential, uh, multi-purpose, and easy to maintain. Uh, and also something that I never actually expected uh, and never really, really planned for is... Uh, so I've been admiring uh, my coach. Actually, that's where the idea came, that Aaron Machano, uh, who has his ideal clients. Uh, and uh, we had the discussion once, and he was telling me, yeah, I, I love spending time with my clients, and you know, we sometimes we hang out together. So I was thinking, wow, would it be so cool to have clients that I actually identify with and really like to hang out with? Uh, and so I had that idea in the back of my mind, but actually I didn't figure out that it was here in this concept for, for a while. And now it's uh, becoming true. Um, so we have a tribe of women who are actually conscious, uh, support each other, uh, and actually want to initiate these kind of conversations by wearing the dress and feel uh, pretty amazing in the dress itself as well. So this is a quote from um, a friend of mine, uh, Maureen. Um, actually, this is an amazing woman that picked up the net herself from a beach. 
uh, and she uh, just got the green dress, uh, and she wasn't even aware that she's quoting when she said this, but I took a note of it. So what she said is, uh, it's what I'm looking for at the moment to trigger the discussion about ocean solutions and raise awareness. Ocean Goddesses Tribe means that through fashion, we can have a community based on what we believe. So that's what she said. <laughs> Uh, and to finish the story, so uh, I basically founded Ocean Goddesses, and only afterwards I realized that it combines uh, three of my priorities, which is contributing and promoting ocean solutions, um, design as a way to express my creativity, but also expressing myself through fashion, like I've always done, uh, and uh, a tribe of uh, women with uh, similar values. So I want to conclude uh, shortly by uh, sharing just a very um, brief story. I don't know if anybody of you recognizes the woman in the picture. Uh, any ocean uh, no conservation people? Uh, so this woman uh, is called Sylvia Earle, uh, and she's very, very famous in marine conservation. She has been a NOAA scientist uh, in-house researcher at the National Geographic. She has been uh, nominated in 1998 as the, the hero of the world, hero of the planet. Uh, she's more than 80 years old and she's still diving. I just met her in Bali. She's still fighting for the ocean uh, and she's uh, just a symbol of, 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 of a brave woman who, who does a lot for us and for humanity. And so basically, I could share a lot of uh, recommendations with you, but probably I thought it's the best if I choose uh, the ones that she said, because it's three very simple things. So she said, what can we do? Well, be careful about what you eat, what you wear, and how you live your life. Also, ask questions. Do, some, do something that will cause people around you to see or understand what you know. And look for the right people who are doing something and simply stand behind them. So those were her recommendations that I was inspired to share them with you as well. Uh, and I would like to uh, almost close before the game, a uh, little game with a challenge. Uh, so the challenge for you, who, for anybody who wants to take it, uh, in case you would like to you know, uh, just uh, test yourself as well, or in case you're in this creation process, is how can you go back to your environment and community and find an idea, product, or service you can upcycle? And just two little pointers. Uh, perhaps start with yourself and a problem that you have, because if you have that problem, the chances are other people do as well. Um, and also look at how that problem relates to the environment and to some problems in the environment as well. So uh, I will return to this in case you want to write it down. Uh, and a gift because you've been so kindly listening to me. So everybody here uh, would actually get 30% off Ocean event as well. Uh, just let me know because I need to give you like a small paper. For that. Um, we're going to close with a very short game. Um, so as I said before, each of the colors uh, promotes different parts of the marine ecosystem. And so we're just going to do a little bit. And you can all and we should all participate, hopefully. So let's start with uh, the green one. Uh, so it's something in the marine environment that it represents. Uh, obviously, it's green. Yeah, it's kind of algae, it's uh, seaweed, yeah. Yes, so it's actually, this, this one is seaweed. Seaweed are really important uh, for producing um, oxygen, um, and they're basically a super important ecosystem for us, so uh, this represents that. Uh, how about the turquoise one? So let me give you a small, very small pointer. Uh, this is a marine critter. Uh, some people don't know that it's uh, a marine animal, actually. Some people think it's a plant. Uh, and it covers uh, less than 0.1% of the seabed, but is responsible for 25% of its biodiversity, of the biodiversity of the ocean. Uh, they're super diverse. They're very colorful. Um, 
Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Good one. Um, this one is actually presenting a uh, fish that we've all seen in cartoons. <laughs> Yeah, Nemo, it's, it's the clownfish or uh, the fish that lives in the anemones and they're sometimes indicator of climate change because like coral reefs, they're very sensitive to temperature, like even one temperature, one degrees of temperature increase of Celsius degrees would make an impact for them and they're very important. And the blue one uh, represents, um, how to explain this, so the Big blue, uh, what we talked about, where most of the water is, uh, excluding the coastal areas. So, it, yeah, it's open ocean. Yeah, open ocean. Open ocean is really important these days because there are a lot of uh, discussions about how people will be using it in the future because it's not uh, owned by any country and we as people need to be like kind of like stepping up as well and maybe stating our own view because governments are already behind <laughs> discussing about this so that's why it's really important and that's why I picked that as well okay great wow thank you uh, yes thank you so much for hearing me and uh, if you wanna if you have any questions we can address them now or we can do that as well later I'm curious to know if uh, there's a particular reason why you develop these dresses with that style. Like, is it supposed to be indicative of something from the mar marine life, or it's just some creative design that you came up with yourself? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it actually is just a creative design that I came up with myself. I was thinking, like, what's the simplest but still elegant and sexy thing that I would love to wear uh, and it promotes minimalism. So yeah, <laughs> it was more or less like that. But it undergo a lot of drawing and some testing and stuff like that. We have two now. Yeah. So I have a question, being a new brand, um, was it challenging in the f sourcing fabric because um, they often, um, suppliers often want you to meet a minimum order, and those can be very large, especially for a new designer or something that's very yeah. specialized. So how did you handle that? <laughs> uh, that's uh, still a challenge, yes. That's still a challenge, especially this one, because uh, it's only created by one <laughs> particular supplier. Um, I'm still trying to handle that, because like the idea for now is uh, small volumes. So very limited, um, so this is going to be a limited collection and I have ordered smaller amounts on basis of like also testing some, um, but in the future I, if I um, have, I'm going to already pass the threshold soon and that will mean that I will have to buy much bigger quantities afterwards. So I will need to see what makes sense and how I can do that. But yeah, that's uh, absolutely a big challenge for limited collections that are limited quantity, because this is going to be like that campaign uh, that women use to um, to voice themselves, to voice what they're thinking, why they're wearing something, you know, it's like a message. Uh, so for me, that's what it represents. I don't have a plan for huge volumes yet. Uh, I do have a plan for huge volumes, but more in like my, uh, in what I'm going to do in future. So uh, I'm working in circular economy projects as well and some other projects, so definitely thinking big volumes, uh, but for this one is now like a limited edition, more of a campaign um, project, which is meant to continue, possibly also with other materials, like such as biofabrics, we'll see. Uh, it's undecided. Um, I was wondering if uh, you have approached different designers and maybe, I don't know how big is the production of the fabric, but encouraging some designers to use the fabric, I think would be also maybe a way to make the, a bigger impact, you know, and the more designers can use yeah. the fabric. Yeah, and, exactly. Um, because yeah. everyone has a different style or, you know, yeah. maybe they can create different things and still the goal of 
recycling and all of recycling, you know? Mm. Would be, so have you thought about it? Yeah, um, I haven't approached yet uh, myself. I mean, I have talked to some that have came on my path because of different reasons. Uh, but I think that that's what the whole uh, tribe is about. That's what the whole campaign is about. It's about like us spreading the message, spreading the word. Well, actually, do you know that you can create it from recycled materials or upcycled materials, you know? And then the designer or the person will look for solutions like that in the future. I will look for a backpack like that. So it's all about like word of mouth and just like building up the movement. Um, and that's what we're all going to do through this type of uh, movement, Ocean Goddesses. Is that answered your question? <laughs> good. But yeah, good question. <laughs> yeah. Yay. Because what I really love and what it's doing with me actually right now, it's kind of inspiring me with what is possible. And you're not talking about creating necessarily your own brand as giving an example to the world, right? About what it is, what is possible of creating of recycled materials. Yeah, what is possible, but I am creating my own brand, yeah. No, no, <laughs> I mean, okay, that's, but you said my main objective is my campaign. Yeah, yeah. And the brand yeah. is a way to get there, right? Yeah, okay, yeah, exactly. Or you can have exactly. both, okay. Yeah. So I can imagine you inspiring people in two ways. One of them is showing them what you can create out of these materials, and the other way is that you influence the market in such a way that people are going to demand of the big fashion producers yeah. that they use these kind of materials that can be part yeah. of the campaign. Yeah, this people is something I really yeah. love about it. Yeah. Exactly, or opt for, the, for that option and then more of that will be uh, used into manufacturing. Yeah, exactly. Well, I hope you're very successful at it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad I inspired you. <laughs> More questions? Stephanie, you want to ask something? You look shy. <laughs> okay, cool. So, yeah, you want to? Oh, okay. I have a question. How do you stay optimistic about the ocean? And even though there are some amazing people like yourself who are so passionate about cleaning things up, but um, I don't know how you not get depressed about all the plastic that still gets thrown in there um, and all that you see that's, yeah, how do you <laughs> remain positive? Yeah, um, that's, an, that's a good question. Um, I would say that I, yes, I do get sometimes uh, depressed <laughs> about what's happening and I know that it's alarming um, knowing the statistics because I'm also like a climate change advocate and I, I know a lot about the science as well behind. Uh, but for me, it's about every one of us making their own bit. And I, I think versus the past, I was more like, um, more had this urgency, but that our urgency scares of people a little bit. So I think through this kind of creative solutions is what I found as a way to communicate it to people because there is a nice story to tell, it looks really nice. So I think this is one of the solutions what I found working instead of like going to people and educating them about, oh, listen, about the ocean, let's. <laughs> so yeah, I think this is, this is really doing our bits, our small bits and just informing people and like even send for the wedding, oh, I just wanna talk at least and, and maybe initiate conversation with one person. So now I get satisfied with smaller, um, conversations, smaller quantities, but I know that I have a big vision in mind, in the back of my mind, and, and want to make an impact on big volumes as well. So it's just like a stepping stone, and I think everybody who comes and joins is a win. <laughs> so yeah, I'm, I'm always staying optimistic uh, about that still. <laughs> Thanks for the question. <laughs> I just wanted to add on that note because if you have more volume of women wearing these dresses, whether they're going to work or a function or a meeting or gathering or cocktail parties, then you mm -hmm. already have that many people talking about it. Because w as women, we always ask each other, hey, what are you wearing? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Where did you get your dress from? So that already instantly starts the conversation. Exactly, yeah. And that's <laughs> where the whole ripple effect yeah. would come. Yeah, so it's a yeah. conversation initiator for sure. It already starts doing that, I see that. Mm -hmm. 
Ocean God. <laughs> um, because, because uh, well, uh, it's uh, the collection line um, is meaningful for women. It dresses because I am actually passionate about dresses. I wear dresses all the time because they're so simple and easy. Just put them on. You don't have to combine anything, match anything, and you look. Um, ocean is because it's cleaning up the ocean and because women feel like goddesses when they wear them, so that's why. <laughs> what, sorry? Oh. what about the boys? Ah. <laughs> ocean gods. Actually, the men are super supportive of this project. Uh, I've been super surprised by them. If you just go on our Facebook or Instagram, you can see a photo with like a lot of men supporting the dress. <laughs> uh, we just made a really fun picture um, the other day. Huh? Yeah, men can buy the dress for the women. <laughs> Where are you going? Good one. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, who would like to try some dresses? Uh, welcome. We can find a way to do that. Otherwise, I'm here if you want to touch them, feel them. Uh, meanwhile, you can uh, email me if you have any further questions. Or you can follow as well uh, the Instagram and Facebook uh, page. That's it for now. Thank you.